Okay, <clears throat> we're going to get the show on the road. I'm Dan Schwartz. I'll be the MC. I'll also join Ron on stage a little bit later to talk about our main subject for today. But before we have club news and notices, I guess before I get into club news and notices, remember Chris Hopkins had a couple of comments he wanted to make about taxes and 401k. So why don't you pop up and we'll get started with that. And please put the phones on silent or vibrate mode. I'm all gone. Morning, everybody. I really just wanted to pass on some information that I recently acquired. I'm a financial advisor. I've been doing it for almost 30 years now. And what I want to say is really directed at U.S. personnel. U.S. people all know about 401k. They all know about the IRA. I assume they do. But there's, when people come like here to Thailand, there's things, options with the IRA and options with the uh, 401k. And such are the, the main options uh, on, on those is that with the 401k, you'll, some, of them, some of the schemes are limited in the investment opportunities that they allow. Some of the charges are high. Um, one of the problems, or what I like to find the problem, you can, in a 401, 401k, you can only nominate one beneficiary. Now, for someone who's got a wife and children or others, um, having all your pension scheme transferred to one person may not be ideal. Um, there's also limits and rules when you want to withdraw some of the cash. All I want to say at the moment is that there are other opportunities. It's not possible to say what can be offered to everybody because it all depends on the age of the person, the amount of cash they have available, what they want to do, what they don't want to do. What I'd like to say is that there are options. If anybody is interested in finding out more about it, I can meet up and do a full analysis. Everything we find out will be in writing. Any charges, fees will be in writing. So everything can be seen and evidence without any problem. The other side of, another version of this is a UAP retirement plan. This is available to US citizens. Now US citizens, sometimes have trouble opening a bank account even. They have trouble trying to invest in certain companies or certain... Oh, sorry. Um, there's certain restrictions on, on US people by the, caused by the US revenue. Now, that can all be avoided. US citizens can invest in a number of different schemes. They can take a 30% withdrawal if they want to later on. There's no tax no US tax on the growth or on the withdrawals from the scheme. Um, and again, there's a wide range of investment options and no limit on, on contributions. And no need for um, pros probate on, on debt or, or distribution. So there are options which may be of interest to some people, not to all, but to some. All I'm saying is that if any of you would like to find out more, I'm happy to meet up, go through it, and explain exactly what you can, what you cannot do, and it'll be up to you to take things from there, or the two of us together to progress further. So, anybody else? Anybody else make any comments at the moment? Obviously, I'm only really giving an introduction, not a full uh, presentation. What was the name of that last scheme you mentioned? Sorry? What was the name of the last scheme you mentioned? UAP. A UAP, yeah. UAP. The UAP normally that would be based in Jersey or Guernsey, which are British protectorates. Um, but you're out of all the US regulations. You don't have to report this to the US authorities. It's set up by a US company. Um, it just gives you the freedom that we English have always had. You can invest offshore and pay no tax on it. <clears throat> I'm going to find out about that one. 
Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. I have his contact details. He's here. He brought business. For those that are Americans in the flies, those that aren't American, um, you guys already can offshore yourselves and avoid a lot of the stuff that Americans can't. Okay, what else is cool? Okay, Songkran. 12th to the 19th is the official week of Songkran in Thailand. Understand the Monday the 19th, the Pattaya Songkran time. Well, 13th is in the middle of that week. There is no water throwing allowed, so it should be well, relatively benign. So the question is, um, everybody want to meet on Tuesday the 13th of April? Or not, because we can get out of it with the hotel, because it is during the sun. It's one of the times we, we are not forced to be here. Um, show of hands, who would like us to have the meeting on the 13th as planned? You don't want to, Gary? He's away. Okay, okay, good. I, I might be away also. There's a good chance because the kid's off school. Okay, so overwhelming majority says the show must go on. Okay, so we'll meet on the 13th. There is no water. Uh, there's lots of announcements in the media, not from the government yet. But there's a lot of stuff talking about the opening up of Thailand and vaccinations or treatments, depending upon what you consider uh, each manufacturer's thing that they inject in you. Talking about um, sandbox with no quarantine. I think there was a meeting or is a meeting, potty of mayor meeting with the uh, appropriate folks to push the idea of uh, a sandbox and eliminating quarantine and things like that. Obviously for people that are vaccinated, they talk about these vaccination passports and things like that. So nothing's final yet, but we'll see what happens. You know, they're talking about April 1st, you know, seven and 10 day quarantine, seven day quarantine if you come from a relatively low risk place and you are vaccinated, 10 day quarantine, no vaccination. Um, all cases, pre-flight COVID, I believe, at least that's what I read, and COVID test on arrival, then they're talking a second phase, which again is gonna go to like to one or three day quarantine with a negative COVID test and being vaccinated, and then eventually like to one day or zero quarantine. That's, that's the plan. If they don't get to one day or zero, I don't see lots of people coming. I mean, people who want to come because they come for three months, because they own a house condo here, a one week quarantine is probably acceptable to get away from some other place if the weather's bad or you don't like it. But if they get it down to a day or nothing, you know, then regular tourists would consider coming just because, you know, it's not that big a deal. So movies talking about a safe and sealed Wonder Island. So they're pushing, they're pushing, you know, get people to Samui and we'll contain everything inside Samui, whatever that is. So they're all talking about that and they want to push for that by July. I mean, obviously everybody wants to push as quick as they can to get tourists here because all the businesses that rely on tourists are dying or dead. A lot of Thai people, I mean, I just read something, you know, a lot of Thais, you know, catching the last bus out of town back to the villages because they can't make any money here because everything's closed. And as I said previously, I think about a year ago, I was with Ron, and I made a comment because you know, we were actually, we're having breakfast at the Devonshire, which is in Soy Lenki, you know, in the Soy Bu Cow area. And I said, all these places are closed. And I said, yeah, in some ways though, it's not that bad a thing because a bunch of the guys who are running these small little beer bar places have one qualification. Two qualifications. They had the money to buy the bar, and the second qualification is they like to drink. And that's, that's they want to be here, and they want something to do, so they spent their money, bought a bar, and they like to drink. They don't actually know how to run a business, because they were whatever they were. And I said, those guys, you know, we're spending money every month to be in business, right? You know, because they weren't, it's slow season, low season for sure, they weren't making any money. So they were running a business, seven day a week business basically, working seven days a week and spending money. That's not a great business proposition. And then Ron made the point, which I thought about it, actually makes a lot of sense. Think about it. They own this little bar. They have a cashier or two, depending upon how many hours a day they're open. They have a couple waitresses or barmaids, bartenders. They have about four Thai staff that work there. 
So those four Thai staff, you know, between them are probably making 60,000 baht a month total for minimum for those four. Well, he closed the bar. So now he's got no outgoings other than his normal living expenses, but that 60,000 baht times all these bars is no longer in the economy. Those Thai people who are making 10, 12, 14, 15,000 baht a month now don't have that. So the hairdresser, the barber shop, the noodle shop, the little apartment, all that, all that money's taken out of the economy. So not so good for, for you know, the Thai service economy for sure. So ho hopefully we can start seeing open up a bit, more people be here. I mean, traffic's not bad. And, and one thing, I, I've said this before, but commending the government on spending the time and spending money throughout this past year during COVID on road improvements, infrastructure improvements. I mean, traffic's a disaster half the time when they were doing all the waterworks, replacing the drainage pipes, the big gigantic concrete ones on Sion Country Club. You know, traffic was a mess. But could you imagine, you know, and they're also doing on Sukum, could you, on Sukum, could you imagine if the normal people were here and they were trying to do that? You know, traffic would be a total disaster. Next up, oh, Central Beach Food Festival, I think opened yesterday at Central Festival now through April 19th. So for the next few weeks, there'll be a nice food festival, attract people to go eat there. Another one, I have a special offer from Absolute Health. They have some pain management and they have gift vouchers for 1800 baht. Um, go ask Lisa for more details since the brochure is in Thai. So we'll get her to explain. Okay, that covers the news and notices that I have. We've got, we're on for the week of Songkran. Next, moving on to our main speakers. Ron is our main speaker. Ron's up first, Ron Cardi. Please welcome Ron to the stage. Ron is gonna open and, and he'll, he'll put up the, uh, the, the write up and we'll, we'll discuss it. But Ron has a long background in training, development, companies, networking, business management, investments, name it, he's done it all. And he was introduced to Bitcoin around the same time I was, maybe seven years, six, seven years ago. He got involved, learned about cryptocurrency, and you've heard him talk before, but the focus of this talk is on how not to get scammed out of your money, how to keep your money under your control, what to look for, what to read, so you see all the red flags and run quick. The problem that's been in the crypto space, especially with investment schemes and MLM companies, network marketing deals, all these kind of things, somebody approaches you and says, throw your money here, send your money there, and you're gonna get this big return. They open up their back office or system that they can log in that's controlled by somebody else and say, look, I put 600 bucks in, I'm already up to $900, I've only been in two weeks. They're selling free money. So there's all kinds of red flags Ron's going to go through and focus on how not to get taken in, how not to let greed take over so that you don't wind up being one of those people going, I wish I hadn't have done that, or my money's all gone, what do I do? Be smarter next time. But anyway, so Ron, I'll cover that part. And there's another area that is was brought up, which is quite important and quite interesting, is how to deal with your crypto assets. And it actually, the concept applies beyond crypto to things like your email accounts, your Facebook, your Twitter, your Pinterest, your Instagram, all that kind of stuff. But how to make sure that he or she who are supposed to get the crypto assets when you pass on, get them and not before they're supposed to. So I'm gonna cover a little bit about that, things you need to think about around inheritance planning for your crypto. So something from, if there's simple steps you can take, I'll cover it, and then in a separate seminar, I'll go into a lot more detail so that somebody can actually get a real plan. So with that, let me turn it over to Ron. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is the Mutton Jeff Show. I'm the warm-up act 
uh, before the main event, right? I just thought I'd tell you now. But actually, I'd forgotten. Um, Dan mentioned that I've been involved in crypto now for about six years by accident, by accident. I bumped into somebody in Patia. Uh, they invited me to join a business that was in the crypto. Uh, they invited me to become their vice president of sales. Uh, they flew me over to the Philippines, and that's where I bumped into Mr. Dan for the first time. And I've got to say, crypto has been kind to me over the last six years. Right? I'm not the techie man. Dan's, we, we work together. Dan is the techie man, uh, and I'm just, I'm not quite sure what I am. All right? But it, I'll be very kind. But I, uh, I know the traps, mainly because I've been involved in some of the traps. You know, uh, crypto has been well to me, but I've also been pulled out a couple of times. Uh, I've been sucked in by the shiny objects. I throw money in, you know, and then watch my money disappear. So I'm talking from experience as well. But this is just a, a quick session. And look, um, as you can see, threw some money in afterwards. Don't forget to share the Gladiator coin story. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. Okay, look, it's interesting for me this one. But I was in Hong Kong, and uh, I'd just been paid in cash uh, from a client. I'd been paid ten thousand dollars in cash from a client. And I, to this day, I don't know whether this was a setup, all right? But I go to the restaurant, and blow me, there's a somebody I've known for a few years, also in the crypto game. And he starts to talk to me about this new venture, this new venture, this new venture. And bit by bit, I get sucked in. And for the first time in my life, I put $5,000 on the table and gave it to him, all right? And then my friend that was with me also did the same. And he kept talking, and of course I'm asking questions now. And I gave him another five. It, this cash somehow moved from there to here to there. And I've got to say, there was an offer. I'm going to talk a little bit about the offer of daily returns. It's the first time I'd ever come across daily returns. And for the first month, I got returns. And I have to. I can't say that I lost money on this one. I can't say I broke about even. All right, um, but. All the things that I'm going to talk about happened. There was a little scam here, there was delays here, there, there was another request to put some more money in. And let you, unless you pay some more, you can't get access. And there I am, the newbie in the game. And so I'm talking from experience. It's so easy to get sucked in. Now, okay, so that's, thank you for reminding me about that painful period then. Okay, but look, there, there, I'll put all this up. But there, there, I believe there is a need to invest. And I'm sure a lot of us in the room have got investments in the normal way. Um, crypto's crept in, right? And I, you know my story, I say to everybody, get involved in crypto somewhere in line, you would be silly not to. Dan and I are doing a session later on today with a group of people, I'm gonna talk about crypto and why you shouldn't get in. My, I talked to my brother, in fact my brother, after all this, last week actually put $100, 100 pounds into Bitcoin last week after six years, how about that? I've driven mad for six years, but look, there's a need to invest. Um, why not look at the crypto world? Um, there's a lot of money being made, there's a lot of money being made in the crypto, and also a lot lost. But my, my main phrase is this, look, be careful, but not fearful. I've met so many people that continually justify why they shouldn't go in, yeah, but you can lose here and this, but that happens with everything. So whenever you put money in, we've got, and I'm not, an, I'm not a financial advisor or anything like that, but whenever you go to put money into anything, there is a risk, right? But my message is be careful, don't be fearful, right? And I'm gonna give some tips on how to be careful, but, and again, as it says there, every, every investment carries some form of risk, I'm sure you do. So look, these are some of the warning signs. I'm gonna run through some things, some crypto businesses, and show how the scams are there. I'm only going to be about 15 minutes, that's all. Then I'm going to hand over to Dan. Dan's going to interject. Uh, one, because I would like him to. Two, there's no way Dan cannot interject. All right, you know Dan. Uh, he, he likes it, buddy. Okay, so look at this one. Only on this subject. Look at this. this is a company called Wisely. Okay, and look at this. The CEO was exposed as, a, as an actor. Was a right, you know, had nothing to do with, uh, there's a lot of these deals, I've got a few of these, I'm going to show you. Some of these names of the companies you may know, you don't know. Uh, I don't know whether you get, but I get lots of stuff all the time now, you know, offers and things. But look at this one, Russian actor. And often you go into a website and there's nice people there, and they're phonies. These, phonies. Are, these are commonly referred to as 
Boris scams. <laughs> All right, so look at this, a Russian actor, okay? What's the next one? Now, Cloud Token, now Cloud Token, look at it says there, they're still stringing victims along. Now, I, how, how long has Cloud Token been known for? Cloud, talk, Cloud Token's been out for, what, 19 months, but they stopped paying everybody, you know, more than a year ago. Okay, but they're still rocking along, look at it, still having a go. Right? Now, they pulled in, how much money did they generate? A couple billion. A couple of billion. Oh, wait a minute, Cloud Token, I think, it, that, that, no, maybe not that much. At their height, they had about 800 million assets under management. That was money that people had given Cloud Token, and that was trading, supposedly, in their Binance account. They had a level nine Binance account, which is trading huge amounts. But they were trading, and they had all the money. That's it. So another warning sign when the website starts to change, things are going wrong. All right, so that's another one, the new website. What's the next one? There's a, now look at this, Talk Trading X exam relies on inaction by the Singapore police. Now, I'm not quite sure what the Singapore police has got to do with all of that. I'll, I'll share that one. Yeah. That come, those people are out of Singapore. And there's a really funny one. There's a picture posted, I think it was even with this article, that the CEO of Torque Trading, which is again another one of these deals like Cloud Token and the like, send your money in, you got your wallet, it looks like you have all this money. They're saying they're trading and they're making returns and they're paying out returns. Well, at one point they just said, oh, we have enough money, not enough money's coming in, more money's going out. Oh, we had a problem, we, our CFO effed off with the money or messed up our trades, but the CEO, like the week before they shut down, had pictures on social media with a $664,000 Ferrari. So this is what exit, that's what exit scam means. Oh, another big one they use is distributed denial of service attack, DDOS, or our site was hacked. Those are all forms of, quote, exit scam. Then they just throw up their hands, say sorry, our losses are too high from getting uh, hacked or this distributed denial of service or our CFO screwed up all the trading. Sorry guys, your money's all gone. They walk with their millions and um, everybody else is left holding the bag. Yeah, and all of a sudden you, you don't have access to your back end, but all of a sudden there's a request for an, an additional admin fee. Pay an additional admin fee, then you've got access. So a couple of 50, you know, 50 or 60,000 people pay admin fees, then the website shuts, gone. So we've really got to watch these things. What's another one here? Oh, another one, they're not active. Bureau Act collapses, okay? Actors again. There's so many people out there that just, it just is not what it seems. You remember I'm saying, don't, don't be fearful, just be careful. You've just got to check all these things out instead of before jumping straight in. What? What's that? Actors with nice offices. It's real yeah. easy, especially during the pandemic, for sure, to go get rental office space at a serviced office. You get this really cool office with really cool people doing really cool videos, and they're not real people. Well, they are real people, as in they're an actor playing a role of somebody in a company. Now, now let me say, look, we're talking about scans. Now, there are some legitimate ones out there, obviously. Right, there are good there are good tokens to get involved in, there's good coins to get involved in, there's good companies to get involved in. What we're saying now is just be aware of all of these things. So if anybody comes along and offers you what we call this shiny object, don't run away, investigate. It may be good, it may not, but just don't jump in willy-nilly. That's the message. Alright, what's another one? Right? No ownership details. Look at this one. Uh, Dan, you can cover that bit. Yeah, this no ownership detail. This this is typical of these smart contract Ponzi schemes. You know, they say smart contract means nobody handles your money because it's software that handles everybody's money. But they don't put a company, they don't put a name. You don't know officially who owns it. Of course, the leaders of the scheme, you know, pop out in videos and stuff like that on Facebook and YouTube. But Basically, they say smart contract, there are no owners. Okay, first thing people, think about this for a minute. Somebody paid somebody else to write that smart contract. Somebody designed the payment plan that is written into that smart contract. Because all the smart contract is, is a piece of software. So if there's no ownership details, that's a huge, huge red flag. 
and we say it because at the moment smart contracts are a big big offering out there. It, it's a it's a payment gateway, it's safe. It means that you nobody can touch your money, nobody handles the money, so that's a big sale. But there's still people behind it, okay? So just be careful when there's no uh, no ownership details. Now this is another one, Daisy AI review. Look at this, securities issue. Now Daisy has been going out not that long. How long? Well there were the people were promoting it, you know, last September, October, November for a December launch that got moved to January and then they opened up for five days and took yeah, in fifty five million dollars. This is how bad. They took in in five days how much? Fifty five million dollars. Now, through acquaintances we know some of the people that are running it and they're not the best people in the world. But I'll make a comment on that one. This important distinction to me. When we talk about, I, I would not say that's a scam. No. It could be, but I would not say it's a scam. The only thing I will say about it is the rules are pretty clear on the definition of what is or is not a security. Rules are real clear. A security is something in which I take my money, I give it to somebody else on the expectation that somebody else, and I'll use that amorphously, you know, somebody else meaning a company or people, they are going to take my money and do wonderful things, and all I got to do is sit back and watch, and I will earn a return. That definition worldwide is a security. What you buy stock in IBM, what's your expectation? Right? You buy some stock in IBM, what's your expectation? You gonna help run their business? No. What are you gonna do? Hold it, get dividends when they pay dividends, and expect capital appreciation, the stock price to go up, and eventually, you know, sell it at a profit or keep it and take the dividends or do whatever. So, and is IBM stock a security? Yes. The way you buy it is from a registered security broker. And if someone's gonna sell it to you individually, they need a license. So those are the that's the comments that I'll make about this. Plus, there's also a few more warnings. Like some of the things we've already covered are already happening. Uh, they had issues, supposedly because of too much input in too short a period, so it shut down. And now they're looking at relaunching again in about a week's time. No, they're supposed to relaunch this week. You know, they opened for five days, blew up the smart contract, blew up the back office software and all that. And since then, it's been almost three months. No, two months. February, March, yeah, two months so, to get it all redone. So already the warning signs are there, new website, maybe a scan, maybe not. I must use the word scan, maybe it's going on, maybe not. But it's a warning sign, all right? Another one, false claims, right? Daily returns using USD, Bitcoin, everything you can talk about, that false claims again. Well, here, here's the, here's this the comment. This is my man. This is here, my here's the comment man. I'll make about false claims. Forget the false claim part. Let's, let's just talk pure numbers. Interest. Okay, how many people have heard of the Rule of 72? Okay, the Rule of 72 basically says interest rate times period, <coughs> sorry, 72 divided by interest rate or period of time will give you how long it takes to double your money. So if you make 12% per period, 12% per period, in six periods if you let it compound, you'll have double your money. Okay, so if somebody's promising they can make you 3% a day, promising, they're guaranteeing, I say in writing, my marketing literature says I guarantee you 3% return every day. And I run a company and I pay out commissions to people who help market this. So I gotta be making at least 4% a day to do that, right? Right, you know, 25% for me, 75% payout. That's actually low. Okay, so four per, I can make 4% a day. What's 72 divided by 4? 18. 18 days. Every 18 days, I would be able to double my money. Now think about this for a minute. <clears throat> if Paul was the super duper mathematical whiz who built this system that could do 4% a day, double his money eight, every 18 days. So at the end, let's just say you can double your money every month. 
if you, you think if you could double your money every month, guaranteed, we're not talking maybe, you know, the normal markets go up, markets go down. You think if you could guarantee you could double your money every month, you could find 100,000 US dollars. Think so? 200? Easy, right? I'm not even talking about marketing. I'm talking about close friends and relatives you like. Didn't say all your relatives, only the ones you like, right? Get 10 people together, put up 20 grand each, you got 200 grand because you, you know unequivocally you're guaranteed 4% of that. Well, 200 grand at the end of the month, you remember I'm going to say it's only going to double monthly, so it's not as good as this is average. You got 400 at the end of a month. End of the second month, you have 800,000. Third month, 1.6 million. Fourth month, 3.2, 6.4 million. 12.8 million, you get up to $500 million, or one billion, I can't remember, it's the number of the math scan, but you get up to like a billion dollars after 12 or 13 months, starting from only $200,000. Now think about this for a minute. If my buddy Paul over there, the expert, can guarantee 4%, he's got the magic sauce for 4%. Um, you think he needs nameless, faceless strangers to invest in that? No, he's going to go find it. He'll go cash in everything he's got, throw a million dollars of his own money at it, and get his friends, put in $5 million. Then you'll have all the money in the world in a couple, in a year or so, year and a half, two years. So anybody that guarantees that. Now, I will say this. There are cryptos that are up thousands of a percent this year. Thousands of a percent. So it's way better than 4% per day. But they could crash to zero. It's not guaranteed. Lots of them haven't gone anywhere. You know, so, so that's the only point I want to make about guaranteed returns. Yeah, and that one was false claims in terms of, uh, as you can see out there, they're saying when they started, when the website was registered. So it's easy to check out, right? That's that one. Uh, Spin-offs. Uh, this is another one where Sully opens up, they shut down, they spin off again, so just be careful of how many times this particular deal has been around, all right? So be careful of spin-offs, uh, they give returns, that's really what Dan was talking about there. Anybody offers you a guaranteed daily return, seriously consider whether it's genuine or not, because as Dan says, it's almost impossible. That's my biggest warning size, guaranteed daily return. I don't know if you want to add anything like that again. No, that was the point I was making. If you can guarantee, if it really is guaranteed, why would you share it? If you have the magic sauce to make 2% a day, 3% a day, every day, guaranteed, zero risk, because that's what they're pitching, why would you ever share it with anybody other than very close people and you all put your own money in and you know you become as rich as Gates and Buffett? Another Ponzi scheme. I can keep going on and on and on. I think the, the sad thing is most people, look, we all know what's wrong. We all know what we should look for. But how come millions of people get sucked into these deals every day, every month, every week? Because they, they just jump in. Then the emotion takes over. Look at this words of wisdom. It's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. And that really is a great saying. It's, it's easy to fool people. Yeah, all the, all the logic in the world suddenly goes out, so just be careful. Don't be fearful, just be careful. Anybody, my message is clear. I, everyone that knows me, I say get involved in crypto. But in my mind, there's absolutely no reason why anybody shouldn't get involved in crypto at the level that they're comfortable with. Right? So, uh, but anyway, so that's it. So the final checklist is this. Check that it's a real company with a real products or service, Right, real people, and it's a real opportunity. Once you're happy, then get involved at the level that suits you, and sit back and keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> All right, that's. I think I'm done. Oh, fun words. Okay, look at this. This is straight out of Dan's book. Only use money that you can live without. Dan, you can add on this one. Let, let me add a couple statements around this. This Ron likes to use only use learning money. Yeah. That's when you're first getting involved in crypto or forex trading or any of those kind of things put in what you're comfortable to spend on your education so that's a good way to look at it i'm going to get in with five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars and i'm going to try it you know 
if I, if I screw up sending $50 worth of Bitcoin somewhere, okay, yeah, I screwed up. Yeah, I lost 50 bucks plus the fee, but it's only 50 bucks. Better you screw up sending 50 bucks to the wrong place, the wrong address, or an address that doesn't exist, than $50,000. So start with what you can learn with, and learn be from anything, make a mistake, and it won't break you. Steer, you know, the failure would steer you to not do that again, hopefully, and you'll be able to be successful. Another rule, my first rule of crypto, Please do not violate this rule. You will be fine if you never violate this rule. Only put money into crypto, and I'd say the same thing with Forex, because they're high, relatively high risk, that you can afford to lose. High risk and high reward. If you're looking for high reward, the risks have to be higher. Because if there's no risk, why should you get much reward? If it's guaranteed, government bonds, you know? Unless you're worried the government's gonna go out, You'll get your interest. But if you want to make a lot more than that, you have to take more risk. Risk goes up and you know, with reward. The other point is the second, the first corollary. Once you put it in, pretend it's gone. Then you sleep great at night. If you're playing with $1,000, don't be watching CoinMarketCap.com or Coin360.com, which has all the prices, or put a price ticker across your screensaver or your phone and look at it every three minutes. It'll drive you nuts, especially if it goes down 12%, you know, in two hours. Again, put money you can afford to lose, and once you put it in, don't stress over it. Now, look at it. It's worth looking at, because now you're learning. And then you can see, wow, I have $1,000. I put some of it in Bitcoin, some of it in Litecoin, some of it in Ethereum, some of it in a few others. And I'm watching what's happening. And I see, well, all these other ones, this new class of crypto, they're doing way better than the old ones, Bitcoin. Well, because if Bitcoin at 60 grand, if it goes up 10%, that's a $6,000 increase to 66, new all time high, and all that kind of stuff. Little ones can go up 10, 15, 20% easy because they trade at pennies. You know, so they still go up a fraction of cents. So, great, these do better. Okay, maybe I move some of my money from Bitcoin over to here. Oh, wow, I made a $1,000 profit. Pull out some money. You know, make yourself feel better. Pretend at that st stage, it's like gambling. In a sense, you go to Vegas, you go to Macau, you go to Marina Bay Sands or Resorts World in Singapore, and you take your 500 bucks with you for the weekend because you're having fun. And if you win 500 bucks, you know, put the original 500 back in your pocket. And if you lose, you're no worse off. I mean, that, that's an attitude. I mean, that's Ron's attitude towards Bitcoin in general. He buys some, he gets some, he sells some, it goes up, he sells some, he gets in some more. If it goes down, he feels a little bit bad, but he's still ahead of the game. So that, that's my two cents on, on how to avoid getting scammed and even if it's, you're going to get scammed or something happens, you didn't pay attention, only do it with money you're prepared to lose. So then it's, you feel bad, but it doesn't really affect you um, going out to dinner, going on vacation, or anything like that. So that, oh, here's Ron's final words. That's it. Resist the pressure to invest quickly. Just take time and investigate before you send any money. One of the cool things about Bitcoin, for example, you don't have to send your money anywhere. You can open up an account on your phone. It's your account. Nobody else has got control. You can buy a couple thousand bucks worth and watch it done. If you had two thousand bucks, the next week it's four thousand bucks. You're in front of the game. And all I know is, when Dan and I first met, Bitcoin was how much? Ooh, three four hundred dollars, five hundred bucks. Three four hundred dollars. Last week it's sixty thousand dollars. That's why I'm able to say Bitcoin's been very kind to me. You know, and I, I didn't understand it, didn't understand it, but got involved. So like, my message to everybody is don't be fearful, just check something out and have a dabble. If you want to know more, we're running some sessions. I know Dan's going to yeah, cover that later. But you can, cut, you can just get involved yourself, very easy. And my happiness is that my brother, after six years, finally bought 100 pounds worth of Bitcoin two days ago. Now, he didn't listen to Ron. He, he hasn't. didn't do it exactly there's, there's the still right a, thing. There's still a few problems there because he's given his 100 pounds to somebody else to put in. 
And that I don't understand. So there's still a little suspect there, but at least he's, had, he's taken the plunge. So my advice, my recommendation is everybody have a go. Have a go. That's it. I'm done. You sure? Yeah. Double check. That's it. There we go. Okay, let me open up my, my part of the presentation. Okay, now we'll move on to the next section, which is, you know, most people don't like to think about inheritance and things like that too much because that means you're doing planning for when you're going to be on the wrong side of the grass. However, uh, it is important. So what I'm going to talk about is how to protect your assets, but make sure when you're not here anymore that those that are supposed to get them can but not a moment too soon. There's a reason for this, when you think about it for a minute. How many people here have Bitcoin or any kind of cryptocurrency? A few, <clears throat> not that many. So, but it's important to think about this, and, then, and Ron brought up what Bitcoin was priced at, you know, three, four hundred bucks, five hundred bucks when we met. The reason why this is also important, I'll cover a little bit later, um, don't think how much crypto you have is too small. Because think about these guys, remember the story of the guy that bought the two pizzas for 20,000 Bitcoin, 10,000 Bitcoin a pizza? You know, Bitcoin back then, you know, that was the 20,000 Bitcoin was 20 bucks. Bitcoin was what, a penny? No, it was less than a penny. Well, it was about a penny, it was say 20 bucks. And who'd have thought it? So you have to think about this for a minute. This is why this is important from a mindset perspective. You had 20,000 Bitcoin in the early days. And you didn't think about, well, what happens? In the early days, it was not nearly as easy as it is now. And you didn't do anything. Well, 20,000 Bitcoin is worth $1.2 billion. $1.2 billion. So you never know. You, know. you can have, there's a coin out there called Pundi X, NPXS. You know, it trades for a fraction of a penny still, but it's the best performing token out there. It's a point of sale system thing. So it's worth fractions of a penny. And who knows, you know, they, they just announced, you know, they're gonna do uh, one, a one million, a one to one, mil, a one million down to one reduction in tokens. So now the token value is gonna go way up because they're gonna cut kind of like a reverse stock split. But the point is, if you had a gazillion of these last year and didn't think about it, well, all of a sudden that thing could go to a dollar, two dollars, because of the of this reverse swap, and all of a sudden what was worth a hundred bucks might be worth ten grand. So it's important to, to think about these kind of things. So we talk about inheritance planning. Well, four goals. Sorry, first goal. You want your heirs or whomever you want to give it to, to be able to get them when the time comes, but not a moment before. Second, Second goal, minimize the risk and the opportunity for people to steal your assets before they're delivered to your loved ones. Very important, right? There, Because there's lots of ways to make it so someone else can access your crypto. But if Ron has my private key to my wallet. All he's got to do is import the private key into a new wallet, and he's in total control of whatever crypto I had in the wallet he has the private key for. So you want them to get it at the right time and then know what to do with it. Next, third goal. You want to get this gorgeous card. You don't want disputes amongst your heirs, so you got to take care of how that's all going to go. Another thing you need to be cognizant of, you don't want it tied up in probate and all those kind of things. So it's probably a good idea if you're going to store some of these things, pick a storage place that someone would have access to or a place they can find it relatively easily but not too easily or not needing a court order or something like that. Fourth one, 
you want them to have the opportunity to hold these assets when they get them securely. Because last, I mean, if you went to all this hard work of earning whatever money you earned, or taking all this risk and buying Bitcoin when it was 10 cents, and now you have $100 million of Bitcoin or $10 million of Bitcoin, um, last thing you would think you would want to have happen is all that work to go to waste. Yes, I know you probably, you don't care anymore because you are on the other side of the grass, but before you would want to do everything you can so people can get it. So perfect solutions are an illusion. There is no perfect security and no zero risk solution. There is. You have to balance security with accessibility about the risks you really have and then figure out how to get around them. I'll give you an example. Leaving your Bitcoin or your crypto on an exchange or on a third party system like coins.co.th, which you've heard us talk about, has risk. Because that Bitcoin is under the control of that third party. So if I leave Bitcoin at Binance or any crypto at Binance, the person or people with actual control of the actual Bitcoin is them, not me. I have an entry on the screen. I can log in. I have an address. I can say withdraw. But they're the one that signs the transaction. So they have, so with a third party, they have all the access. They have all the control. So the point I'm making is, depending upon what percent of somebody's wealth that is, that's okay. If you want to trade, you got to leave money at the trading place. Or you want to trade at E-Trade, Scott Trade, any of the brokerage houses, right? You want to trade stocks, you want to do online trading of any kind, eToro. I know that's a bad source subject. <laughs> but the point being, you got to send money there. They control your money. And the stock, if it was a stock, is held in their name. But you're weighing the convenience of doing it that way versus holding it in your own name. Similarly, Ron, Ron doesn't own a USB Bitcoin stick, a Trezor or a Nano Ledger, because in his mind, the way he's got himself set up, he's perfectly happy with the amount of convenience he has relative to the risks he's taking. Also, another one, again, we're talking inheritance and people, because people are in this equation. No, pro no perfect process, guaranteed to work, true for all inheritance planning, not just crypto. Even if you have a great plan, your heirs may not be able to actually access it due to reasons outside of their control. You know, what happens if something blows up? You know, there's nothing you can, you can't foresee everything. The vast majority of people in the vast majority of situations, however, with a well-designed, well-executed, current tested access plan with enough information will enable your heirs to get access to your crypto. That's a bit of a mouthful. What it means is write it all down, and I'll share a little bit of how, but you write it all down and you got to keep it up to date and you need to test to make sure what's true. I'll tell you a funny story. We were helping somebody set up a wallet using an extension to Chrome. It was a Chrome extension. So Ron wrote in the instructions, go click the little jigsaw thing, and the extension will pop down because it wasn't up top. So this person, a friend of ours, like, where the hell, what's a jigsaw? Type jigsaw, Google jigsaw. Well, if you look at your Chrome extensions, right, when you get when you run out of space, you know, the last one looks like a little jigsaw. And that you click that and the one all of your extensions that you have installed with Chrome are in a list. And then you can find the one you want because there's only a limited amount of space. But that was pretty fun. So even if you did it perfectly, you better test that because they're gonna ask, what the heck's jigsaw? You know, something like that. So be careful. Okay, here's some disclaimers and clarifications, the kind of legal stuff around this. Number one, this material is based on my seven years of doing this and writing and talking and presenting. And I have a copy of this book by Pamela Morgan Esquire. She's a lawyer who specializes in this stuff. So I use some of her stuff and include mine. 
we have a complete section of this course that we're going to be running that will talk in greater, much greater detail so you can actually get a basic plan. Nothing's legal advice, it's just a starting point. And if you have specific questions about inheritance, don't ask me. Talk to an attorney. You know, if you want, if your assets are in Thailand and you want them under Thai law, then one person to go talk to is go talk to Kelvin Banfield because he's good at final wills and all that, make sure they're legal. Um, if you're an expert, you can adjust your plan a bit. However, remember your heirs may not be an expert. So keep it simple so that people who need access can get access. It's not a security presentation. This is all about enabling you to pass on access to the people that need it after you pass on. And if you follow it, still no guarantee that they'll be able to get access because we don't have control over them. But at least if you write it down and you test it yourself and you keep it up to date, it should work because you can do it. But one, one thing, this is an important one. For anybody who's crypto savvy after you've been doing it for a while, don't make an assumption that they know how to even use computers very well. So that's why you keep it simple. Now here's another one, an in this is called device independent recovery strategy. You want, this planning is around them not having access to your phone or your laptop or your tablet. This reminds me of a funny movie. It's actually called The Assassin with Will Smith. I had it backwards, but someone got it straight. In The Assassin with Will Smith, he's, he's this super assassin, right? And the government needed him to do something, but he's in prison. And there's this hard-ass military guy who rides him all the time. So they let Will Smith out. On the table in front of him is a complete assortment of weapons, including clips with bullets and stuff. And the lady boss says to the other guy, you know, to the guys, unshackle him, because he, he supposedly never missed. So he picks up the gun, puts in the clip real quick, and then he holds the gun to the head of the guy who rides him all the time. And he goes, I told you this was a bad idea. I told you he's going to shoot me. And then he goes, now, he talks to the guy that works. Now, if he shoots me, first thing you do is you go back and erase my browser history. Because <laughs> he was probably looking at funky things. So the point is, you don't, for privacy reasons, necessarily want people mucking around your stuff. So you set up the strategy to do it independent of your devices. Now, nothing says you can't let them use your device, but just in case they can't get access. So this is set up all around not having access to your devices. So they don't need access to get your assets. They're going to back up all your seeds and seed phrases, keywords, access codes on paper or some standalone electric device. It's really funny. I was reading the book and thinking about it. You definitely want to back up using pen, pen, not pencil, and paper. Because that's the most secure. People don't know how to erase stuff securely from their computers. You think you've erased it, you know, you deleted it. It's actually easily recoverable if you just delete a file. You actually have to use shredder software and all kinds of things if you want to securely erase stuff. So again, it comes down to how much you have and, and how fancy you need to go. But this isn't fancy. Paper and pen works fine. Then people can get these assets without your devices, which is good. Plus, your privacy is maintained, so nobody's snooping around your computer. Unless you don't care and there might be stuff you want to leave on your computer that people could access. Oh, that, that's up to you. Now, another thing to think about while you're doing this for crypto is what about your other accounts? Email, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. It all depends how active what you do, what you have. And each of them have their own policies. And the strategy needs to be more than just leaving a password. Because again, very few people in this room have crypto. Maybe your kids and your grandkids do, but they would know better than you. But if you've been doing it for a while, you can't assume anybody knows anything. And device independent recovery, 
enabling people to access this is critical. Good for time. Now, here's six mistaken beliefs on how to go do this. Number one, you need a lawyer. No, you don't need a lawyer. Number two, you have to trust a third party. No, you don't have to trust the third party. Number three, planning is going to make my assets easy to steal. Actually, no. If you actually go through the plan, you'll probably figure out, oh, they are easy to steal right now. The value, this is an important one. The value of my crypto assets are too small to worry about this. You can't let that one stop you. Unless you have, you know, a dollar worth of crypto. Okay, it goes up a thousand times, it's a thousand bucks. You might have a thousand of some crypto that's only worth a little bit, but something happens and now a thousand becomes worth a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars. You don't know. My heirs will figure it out. No, maybe they won't. There's a, I just read an article of the about 18 and a half, 18.7 million Bitcoin that have been mined since day one. More than 4 million are lost forever. 4 and 18. That's 20, over 20% of all the Bitcoin that has ever been created is no longer accessible. Gone. And this last one, for those of you that are somewhat crypto savvy, this can all be done with a smart contract. That's a piece of software, basically, that runs on the blockchain. But actually, that's not such a good idea because then you've just passed all control in the sense of how this is going to go down to some people that wrote that software, which you didn't write, you didn't audit, you know, who knows? I mean, smart contracts have been hacked. They could take it offline, there could be a problem. So that's probably not a good idea. So to get it done, you got to start somewhere. So you make your first plan. You write a basic plan for your heirs. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to be 100% complete, but it sure as hell is better than zero, which is what virtually everybody has right now. It's going to improve the chances of them actually inheriting some of your assets. And you just do it like a letter written to your heirs, cover just the basics. Who can help them? This is important. I'll cover this in detail in the, in the detailed section, but not who you're going to give everything to, but who can help? Besides you, right? Somebody that I, any of my friends ask, you know, want to know about crypto stuff, they call me. And who, who do you ask for help yourself? Who do you work with that could help? Because I have a good friend, and he's got it all written down for his girlfriend that she's going to get X, Y, and Z. And it's all written down. I helped him put it together. He's got it all written down, and, and it says, call Dan if you need any help or if something ever happens to me, I'm totally incapacitated, you know, I'm in a coma and whatever, and you need help or you want access, you need access to my crypto, not stuff that is for you directly, just come see me and I'll help you. So you think about who can help, but you don't have to, I don't have all that stuff. I don't, they do, and they have it somewhere, but she knows to come find me. Also, don't trust any one person because people can get blinded by greed. It's one thing I have access to $3,000 of your money. It's like, yeah, he's trustworthy for at least three grand, but 30 million, you know, how, you know, 30 million, a lot of people could be influenced by direct access to $30 million as an example. And this letter is meant to be an interim measure. Again, we'll cover it a little more detail later, what the further update should be. But at least if you had it written down in a letter to whomever you want to get your crypto, saying, I put this in the safety deposit box, this is in the safe, this is here, call Dan or call Ron or call Peter, call Tom or Joe, whomever these people are that are smart about this stuff, the chances of them actually getting access to the crypto you want to leave them is a lot higher than not having any of that. So always remember these goals in order. Number one, you want them to get your assets after you're gone and not a moment before. 
Minimize the risk and the opportunity for anybody to steal them before they get to your loved ones. Give the opportunity for your loved ones to be able to hold it themselves securely. And the last one, prevent disputes among your heirs, heirs and avoid legal problems wherever possible. What's next? After this, 1.30, 2 o'clock, we'll start. We'll be over at Robin Hood in their back room to have uh, introducto, introductory to crypto seminar. A little bit different than we did here. So for those of you that saw the original one, it will be different. Um, so it's worth coming. No charge. Only thing we ask is since Robin Hood gives us the room for free and the projector for free, everybody buy a snack or a drink to keep the owner of Robin Hood happy. And then we've scheduled for next Wednesday and Thursday, because if there seems to be interest in doing the Tuesdays, we'll do Tuesday as a free introductory seminar for maybe 45 minutes, and then another 45 minutes to an hour is kind of a crypto forex meetup for people to hang out, talk, ask questions, uh, interact, talking about the subject. And then Wednesday and Thursday is a three hour seminar each day and basically teach you and ensure by the end of it, you can trade, you can open wallets, you have wallets, you can transfer money yourself, all those kinds of things. And the special offer we have, it's only 4,000 baht and 2,000 baht you'll get back as Bitcoin or other crypto in your wallet at the end of the seminar. So the idea, the reason to do that Everybody will be guaranteed to have 2,000 baht worth of Bitcoin or something, but we can talk about which one, so that not only did you set up a wallet, but we ensured you actually got something in your wallet and, and we'll help everybody bring your laptops so that you're enabled, able to do it, especially for trading. I mean, buying and selling basics you know, on phone apps is fine, but trading, it's a little easier when you have the bigger screen. So that's what it is. Ron and I will be presenting it a week from tomorrow. So that covers all I wanted to cover. Any questions? We have time for a few questions. And then Ian will be up for open forum. Not yet. We have questions first. Okay. Any questions? All right, thanks. thanks for the presentation, very interesting. My question is, where do you put the letter where you put all your stuff down? And, okay, the question is, when I write this letter that has lots of information, where do you put it? You want to put it in a place that it can be found, but not that it's totally out in the open. Well, here's why. And you're not going to put everything in the letter either. It's not going to have all. It's not going to have the private key to all your wallets because if somebody gets that letter, um, they've got all your crypto. So you got to put it in a place that, when you pass on, someone will find it. Now it could be that you have a safe in your apartment, condo, house, or whatever, and you got to keep a copy in there, and you tell your wife. You know, you leave a note somewhere saying, hey, it's in the safe, and hopefully you've left also how to get in the safe. That's, that's one way. Well, but safes can be, especially home safes, unless you are super security conscious and get one that can't be broken into. I mean, you can get into a safe. It's just meant to deter the normal burglar stuff. But put that letter for sure in a place that's waterproof and relatively fireproof. Because again, you know, stuff happens. You go to all this work and there's only one copy of the letter and it's in your drawer, which is a relatively safe place that someone might go look eventually, and your house burns down. You know, then bye-bye all this hard planning work. Yes? At the beginning you were showing the scans. Yep. It seemed like it comes from some website. Is there some, some website which publishes the type of the scans where you can look it up? Yeah, sure. There's two ways. One is the first thing to do is anytime anybody pitches you anything, just Google the name of the thing and, and add the word scam. 
you'll get all kinds of references. Now, that's not a guarantee that it's a scam, because, for instance, in, if you give me a half an hour, I have a website up that ranks somewhat in Google with your name and your picture. So you have to do a little bit more than, oh, I saw a bad thing about something on the internet, therefore it's a scam. So you look at the body of knowledge. That site's behind MLM. Behind MLM. Now a little warning on that site, if you go there, he hates MLM. Now, that's a good thing and a bad thing. He's right most of the time. In other words, if he says it's an out and out Ponzi scheme or it violates securities rules, believe him, because it's clear there's a thing in America called the Howey test. Came out from a famous case years ago. That's how you, there's four pieces to this test. And if you qualify under any of them, you be, you're considered a security. So that like the, the simplest way to think of a security, which is which is he talks about a lot of them, is putting money in a common place, a common pool, giving money to somebody else in the expectation I'm gonna make money. If that is what I am being asked to do, if I say, hey Paul, give me a hundred thousand baht and I will invest it for you myself in our platform and I am going to pay you 2% a day or 1.5% a day or variable between 1 and 3% a day, I just sold him a security. Because he just gave somebody else money on the expectation they're going to go make money for him. So that, that, that kind of stuff, he's, he's virtually always right. He, he's not always right. I mean, I read it every day. But it, that's where, where most of that came from. Um, you can do this with uh, other assets you have, but I'm not sure whether you can do it with crypto. Suppose you have a mansion. Uh, I think you can sort of, uh, you don't feel like uh, writing a will for it or uh, planning inheritance for it. So you basically reverse mortgage. I want to live well today, not after I pass. Oh, okay. I know what you're talking about. Well, with a house, in America this is common, you can get a reverse mortgage. I have a house that's worth half a million dollars. Um, they figure out my life expectancy and they say, hey, we'll pay you $2,000 a month for the next uh, 10 years, whatever it is, or five or eight years. They give you some amount. And if you outlive the mortgage, they, they still keep paying you and you can still keep living in the house. And that way you get the money up front. Well, in crypto space, what you can do there are lending platforms. So you can lend a Bitcoin and get interest on it. And you, or you can, you can lend it so you can get interest or you can borrow against your crypto. See what a lot of people, what happens to a lot of people is they wind up with five Bitcoin right now and that's worth almost 300 grand. And they see some other investment opportunity that they need some of that money. Well, the choices are I need 100 grand to invest in, I got some sweetheart deal on a property. So I can sell 100 grand worth of my Bitcoin, but maybe I don't wanna do that because I think Bitcoin's gonna be way better performer than other things. I just wanna diversify a little bit and I'm waiting for money to come out of somewhere else. You can borrow against your Bitcoin. You still own the Bitcoin, you pay some interest, and Binance or one of the large platforms will lend you against your Bitcoin. So you, you could do that, and then if you die, they've got your Bitcoin, and they've got, you know, they do the loan to value ratio such that they're okay, and you have a high um, degree of motivation to pay them back. Any one more question, and then over to Steve. Not Steve, over to Ian, sorry, Steve's not here today. You have your presentation already open, Ian? All right. Cool. And for those of you who are coming, we'll see you at the Robin Hood uh, round two. A little bit before. Thank you. Next up, Ian Nicholson for Open Forum. Right, has anyone got a question they need answering? 
a general question. Nobody? Why did you come? 